Hello, dear friends, and welcome to our study on the book Genesis by Ellen Kardec, which we're holding every Sunday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're live broadcasting from Northern California, where we're currently experiencing a power outage. So we're doing our best to operate off of our phone and um, we don't have Wi-Fi. So hopefully the internet connection will be strong enough for us to maintain this program. So dear friends, last week um, we continued in our chapter 15, which covers the fluids. It is a very interesting and very important chapter. Why is it important? Because the fluids play an integral part of the so-called supernatural manifestations like miracles. And several weeks ago, we understood that since spiritism is now among us, thank God, the supernatural phenomena have become less and less because spiritism helped us to create new laws and explain those so-called supernatural phenomena. And at that very moment, it is the fluids that play a central role. And that is why we're diving deep into this chapter so that later on when we go to uh, the description and analysis of Jesus's um, so-called miracles, we have the theoretical knowledge. We know how the mechanisms work. So last week we talked about somnambulism, ecstasy, and second sight, and we also touched on healings. So I mentioned last week that there is an amazing summary that you can find in the Spirit's book, and it's question 455, and it's entitled A Theoretical Summary of Somnambulism, Ecstasy, and Second Sight. And um, before that summary, you find several questions and answers that Alan Kardec posed to the spirits on high. So that whole chapter would be an amazing, very important companion study. So some somnambulism, ecstasy, and second sight are no more than varieties of, or modifications of effects arising from the same cause. And the cause is the spirit. So when we um, go a little bit deeper, we're just going to rehearse for a moment what we've gone through so we can build on today. Because today, let me tell you, we are going to study, um, let's see, just a second here. We're going to study apparitions and transfigurations. So that'll be in a minute, but let us recap for a moment. So the spirit is the one that sees the spirit is the one that hears and the spirit is the one that feels in its entire being. So there are no specific organs in the spirit that allows it to see, hear and feel. And um, it is actually happening within the perispiritual fluidic radiation. Now, why do we say radiation? It's because the perispirit is not, does not have exactly the same size and shape as our bodies, it actually radiates out. And so the seeing, hearing, and feeling, it happens in its entire being within the perispiritual fluid. It's a fluid, it's very important. So second sight, dreaming, and somnambulism is one and the same manifestation, one and the same thing according to Alan Kardec. Different words and different nuances, but essentially it's the same um, thing. That's his word. Both in somnambulism and in dreams, the soul wanders through the terrestrial worlds. So there is an emancipation of the soul that's happening while the body rests, for example, or is in a deep meditation, there's different circumstances, but the soul travels. So, um, the other subject we touched on last week is catalepsy. So the definition of catalepsy is 
that it is a condition that occurs in a variety of physical and psychological disorders and is characterized by the lack of response to external stimuli. So there is no response in the physical form to external stimuli. There is muscular rigidity and fixity of posture so that the limbs remain in whatever position they're placed. So now from the spiritual perspective, what is going on? Well, what's happening is, is there's in catalepsy, there is an interruption being experienced. And it's the interruption of the transmission of sensations to the sensory center. And what is the sensory center? The spirit. So let's say the sentence again. So there's an interruption of the transmission of sensations to the spirit. That's what happens in catalepsy. And it is produced within the perispiritual fluid. All right. So this is, this is so we're going to say it again. So there is in catalepsy, there is an interruption of the transmission of sensations to the sensory center, which is the peri, which is the spirit. And it is produced within the perispiritual fluid, that interruption. We also learned that the nerves are the conductors. So there's interruption. So the external stimuli is not actually going all the way through to the spirit. So um, the other thing we talked about is resurrection. As long as... The disconnection from the spirit, the, the, the disconnection of the spirit from the physical form has not been broken. Because in what we just talked about in catalepsy, that connection stays. There's just an interruption happening, right? But in resurrection, as long as this bond between the spirit and the physical form via the peri-spirit is not broken, then the resurrection happens and it is through the energetic action of the spirit's own will or through the equally powerful outside fluidic influx. And those two phenomena bring the spirit back to the body. So let's say that again. The spirit emancipates from the body, but the fluidic tie is still in place and travels, gets information, does, all, does, does its thing, just to put it blandly, right? In order to come back, that fluidic tie cannot be broken, is not broken. And that moment when the spirit goes back to the body is when an energetic action happens and it's based on the will of the spirit. So the spirit somehow decides it wants to go back to the body or when there is a fluidic external influx, which brings the spirit and the body back together. So those are those moment near death experiences. I mentioned examples last week where at a certain time on planet earth, there were little bells installed in graves so because back then there wasn't um, there wasn't enough knowledge to really find out 100% that somebody had passed on. So they would occasionally bury people alive. And so if this kind of resurrection was going to happen, then the person could ring the bell even though they were already buried. All right. So that is the definition of resurrection. And lastly, what we talked about last week is healings. And that's very important because as we know, Jesus performed so-called miraculous healings. So here we learn what's behind it. So the universal cosmic fluid is condensed in the perispirit and can supply laboratory elements to a body. So the cure lies, the answer lies ultimately in the perispirit. The universal, the perispirit is a form, is part, is made out of 
the universal cosmic fluid. And as Alan Kardec, the words he uses is the universal cosmic fluid condensed in the spare perispirit can supply respiratory elements to an ailing body. The driving agent is either a discarnate or incarnate spirit, which injects a portion of the substance of the substance of the perispirit into the deteriorating body. So when we look at Jesus when he performed these healings, he must have used parts of his very illuminated, healthy, vibrant perispirit that he injected into the ailing bodies of those he healed. So healing equals replacing unhealthy molecules with healthy ones via injecting a vibrant aspect, a part of another person's perispirit into one that is not healthy. So the curative power then lies in the purity of this injected substance from the perispirit, the energy of the will and the intention of the healer. So there's three components in these healings that happen through injecting a, a healthy perispirit into an unhealthy one. So the curative power lies in the purity of the injected substance, namely the purity of the perispirit of the spirit who, is, who does the injecting. And the components are the energy of the will, the, the desire to do a healing, and the intention of the healer. And this can come from an incarnated spirit as well as a discarnated spirit. So this is important, right? In case of Jesus and his miraculous healings, he was incarnated. And he donated that energy, that fluidic um, perispiritual injection uh, to another incarnated spirit. The action can be slow of these healings, or they can they might need they might require prolonged treatments. In case of Jesus, they were instant, right? But sometimes, you know, in other cases, it takes a while over and over again. They can be quick like an electric current, zoom, and it happens. All heal healings are varieties of magnetism. Only they only differ in their intensity and speed. So in other words, these healings, it means that the fluid performs the role of a therapeutic agent with its effects depending on the quality and on its quality and circumstances. So depending on the quality of the perispirit that is being used for the injecting and the circumstances, circumstances the, the effects whether they're quick, whether it works at all, maybe in some cases it doesn't work, um, whether it's instant or is prolonged, it depends on that, right? on the purity of the fluid, the intent, and um, the energy of the will. So it's very fascinating when we think about it. These are the explanations of, of later on when we're going to study the actual um, events this is the knowledge we have to really download, we have to really understand, because then we can literally scientifically explain them. So then there's three elements. So the magnetic action production, production of action is a, can happen through the magnetizer's fluid. That's magnetism per se, it's human magnetism. And it depends on the quality of the fluids. So the magnetizer is the one who is actually donating the spirit, who has the will and the intention. The other one is through the fluid of the spirit acting directly and without intermediary upon the incarnate. So one comes from the magnetizer themselves, that's an incarnated spirit, that's the magnetism per se or human magnetism. Another example would be the fluid of a spirit that's acting directly and without intermediary upon an incarnate spirit, which is then labeled spirit magnetism. Or scenario number three would be when the fluids that spirits pour onto the magnetizer who is an incarnate, 
who would be then the conductor? So like, let's picture spiritual passes, right? So I'm this pass giver and somebody sitting in front of me, I would be the magnetizer. A spirit would be giving me um, the, its fluids and I would be the conductor to pass it on to the pass, passes receiver, so to speak, right? And that's then called the spirit human magnetism or the, the semi-spirit magnetism. That means then that the human and the spiritual fluid, so the magnetizers, in this case, my fluid and that of the spirit get combined and passed on. Fascinating, right? Fascinating. So that is that is the summary of that. Let me see one if there's any comments, dear friends. Hi, Wagner Jr. Hello, thanks for joining, dear friend. Tony, so lovely to have you. Dear Nora Brazil, thank you for joining Dear friend, Lisa Tellis, thank you for being here. And Flavia, Flavia Le, Le Pene. And let me see, and there's also Wagner Jr. again. All right, friends, so let us continue. Now let us go and start with um, today's study, Apparitions. So you find that chapter on page 304 in the Spirits book. And um, let's see, I can see um, that it is, and it's entitled Apparitions and Transfigurations. All right. In its normal state, the Perry spirit is invisible. So this is important to know, right? This baseline. But since it is formed, it's in invisible to us. But since it is formed of ethereal matter, the spirit can, in certain circumstances, and through an act of its will, cause it to undergo a molecular modification that renders it momentarily visible. All right, so what was he saying? So under normal circumstances, we cannot, it's not visible to us. We cannot see the perispherit. But since it is, the, the, it's, it's an ethereal um, matter, Perispirit is an ethereal matter. The spirit can, in certain, certain circumstances, and through an act of its will, cause it to undergo certain molecular modifications so that it can render itself momentarily visible. Fascinating. This is how apparitions, this is obviously an explanation of an apparition, are produced. This is how apparitions are produced. The spirit wills to make its perispirit visible. And because of this desire to do so, molecular changes take place. And this phenomena does not occur outside of natural law. So it's not a miracle. So it still falls under the law of God, under law of nature under the natural law so this is important because right at that very moment it's not a miracle it can be explained there's laws behind it this is no more extraordinary than steam which is invisible when highly rarefied that becomes visible when condensed depending on the degree of condensation of the peri-spiritual fluid so depending on the degree of condensation an apparition is sometimes vague and vaporous. So it can be either vague and or vaporous, but at the other times, it can also be clearly defined. So the perispirit can either appear vague or vaporous. And in other cases, depending on the so-called condensation, which is just really it's not really condensation, but it's a play on words. It just helps us to understand it. Um, it is more clearly defined. And finally, at other times, it has all the appearances of tangible matter. It can go even that far. It can even attain true tangibility to the point that the observer is fooled as to the nature of the being in front of him or her. So there's different densities, different apparitions from very vaporous 
appearing ones to very dense ones. Vaporous apparitions are common and occur frequently when individuals present themselves in such manner to their loved ones after having died. So after people discarnate, they invariably show themselves to their relatives and friends and, and neighbors in a more vaporous apparition. So this is the more common one. Then the tangible apparitions are much rarer, although they're rarer, although there have been numerous perfectly authenticated cases of them. If a spirit wants to make itself known, it gives its envelope all the outward markings that it had while living. So we know that a spirit can will itself to a alteration of the molecular structure of its perispirit so that it can appear either vaporous or more clearly or actually pretty dense, appearing dense to incarnates. And that is often how those who are freshly discarnated show themselves to their family members. However, a spirit can also take on other forms depending on their will. They can go back to other incarnations and assume that look. So, um, so apparitions are part of the law of nature, so they are not a miracle. And they can be either vague or clear. And um, the most common ones are the vaporous ones, but there's also tangible apparitions that are documented. All right, friends, and please feel free to ask questions. And I'm hoping I, I see them. All right, so we're moving on. Now we are at um, item 36 on page 305. It should be noted that tangible apparitions have only the appearances of corporeal matter. They only have the appearances of corporeal matter. They could not possess the qualities. They're, they're not really flesh and blood. They only appear to be that way, right? Due to their fluidic nature, they cannot have the same cohesion as matter because in reality, they're not made of flesh. Makes total sense, right? So it just appears to be in those denser apparitions, they appear to be actually made out of uh, flesh and blood, but they're, they're fluids, they're fluidic in their nature. They form instantly and disappear the same way, or they evaporate through the disaggregation of their fluidic molecules. So they can appear like this, but then also disappear. The beings that appear under such conditions are not born not nor do they die like human beings so when there is an apparition if when jesus appeared to the disciples in form of an apparition he wasn't born again he wasn't in flesh and blood he would appear and then disappear so it wasn't he wasn't made out of flesh and blood right so i think that's clear it was just a fluidic appearance the beings that appear under such conditions are not born. We said that. They are seen and no longer seen without the observer knowing where they have come from, how they have come, or where they are going. No one could kill, shackle, or imprison them since they have no corporeal body. Trying to hit them would result in striking a vacuum. All right. I think we understand that, right? So such is the nature of them with whom one may so such is the nature with whom one can communicate without suspecting what they are, but who do not stay very long and cannot partake in the habitual sharing of food. So in other words, his case is really that we're not being fooled that these apparitions are incarnates like like you and me. Right? So I think we got that. So he further describes that when we are confronted with an apparition, we feel that um, the entire person, there's something strange and unusual about it, about them. Their gaze is vaporous and penetrating and uh, does not have any clarity in their gaze. 
and he says that um, their speech is brief and almost terse and they don't have the lust, the voice doesn't have the luster of human speech. And he, he says that um, there's a certain sense of dis-ease, unease when we are around apparitions. Um, and we would walk away and say, now that was a pe peculiar person. <laughs> so, okay, let's, let's stop because this is pretty dense stuff, right? So the tangible apparitions only appear as corporeal matter. They're not really corporeal matter, right? Apparitions form instantly and they also disappear instantly or evaporate instantly. And it, it, they evaporate through the disaggregation of the fluidic molecules that came together to create this apparition. Beings that appear like that, so apparitions, they're not actually born. They're not like us incarnated. We can communicate with them. Um, their eyes seem a little bit strange and the proximity of them is odd and often instill, instills fear in us. So we're moving on to item 37. So we're still under the headline of apparitions. These are just different information, pieces of information we're gathering. Since the perispirit is the same both in incarnates as well as discarnates by means of a completely identical effect, an incarnate spirit can, during a moment of freedom, appear in a place different than where its body is lying and display its customary manifestations and all the marks of its identity. This phenomenon of which there are many authenticated examples have given rise to the belief in human doubles. So if, for example, a body is resting asleep or is just um, calm, the perispirit can travel somewhere else and appear just to others in form of an apparition. Now, that does not mean that when you're lying there, and people can see you lie there and then they see you as an apparition that there is a human double. We just learned that a perispirit can appear in a different place than where the body is. And this is during moments of rest. So this phenomena has given rise only to this belief of human doubles, but it's not actually human doubles, right? So the perispirit can travel and then appear, create an apparition, right? I hope that's clear. Now, please do ask if you, if you have any questions. And then um, let us move on to, to item 38, also still apparitions. So one particular effect of this type of phenomena is that vaporous and even tangible apparitions are not perceptible to everyone indiscriminately. So you may be able to see a vaporous or even a tangible apparition, and I may not be able to see it. Spirits show themselves only when they want and to whom they want. So it might be that you, the spirit shows themselves to you, but not me. So this is another variance, right? So the spirit wants to appear a certain way, the apparition is formed and appear to a certain person and maybe the next one, they're not gonna show themselves to them. So this is really important to know, right? Thus a spirit could appear to a group or to one or more of those present without being seen by the others. So when we're in a group and somebody says, oh, I'm seeing Aunt XYZ and she's standing right there next to you and, and we're looking and, um, and we all hear, yeah, there, there is an apparition happening. So we're invited not to judge, right? Because now we're learning that this apparition might just show itself to one or two in the group or just certain individuals in a group, but not to others. And that is because the spirit doesn't want to appear to others, right? This happens because these types of perceptions occur by means of spirit side and no physical side. So that's the other um, 
this is the other um, component to it. Because not only is the spirit side not given to all persons, but it can be taken away by an act of the spirit's will. So one is the spirit doesn't want to appear to one or the other. And the other one is, is that the spirit side, the ability of us to see apparitions or spirits, we don't all have the same capacity. Some of us have it or have developed it and others haven't. So spirit side is not physical side. That means not everyone has it. And also those who've had it or have it, it can be taken away by an act of the spirit's will from whoever it does not wish to show itself, just as it can give it temporarily if it deems it necessary. So there's so many variances, right? And they help us to not go into judgment. If we see apparitions and the next person to person next to us doesn't, you know, there's so many, the spirit can sh it show itself just to one person and not the other. It can take spirit side away from some who has it, or some people don't have spirit sides and others have it developed. So there's many variables. The condensation of the perispiritual fluid in apparitions, even to the point of tangibility, lacks the properties of ordinary matter. We said that before. Apparitions does not mean that there is literally an incarnate standing in front of us with flesh and in flesh and blood. So it's like it's a fluidic um, body. Otherwise, apparitions would be perceptible to the eyes of the body, and then everyone present would see them. Makes sense, right? Since it's not a regular incarnate, it's not flesh and blood, it's not that, it doesn't have that density, it's not, cannot be seen. It, if it were that dense, like you and I, then it could be seen by the physical eye, but apparitions can only be seen by the spiritual eyes, through the spiritual eyes, and we learned just a minute ago that some have that spirit side, others don't. Those who have it can lose it if a spirit doesn't want to show itself to us. Let me check, any questions? No, it doesn't look like it. So, so one, one, one more time. Not all apparitions are perceptible to everyone. And it doesn't matter whether it's a vaporous or a tangible one. Not all of them can be seen by everyone. Spirits decide who and when they want to show themselves. Within a group, some may see the apparition, others may not. Spirit sight is responsible for seeing spirits. And not everyone has it. And uh, spirits who are the, the ones who create their apparitions can take it away from, from incarnates because they may not want to show themselves. All right, so let's see. Now we're moving on to item 39. Item 39 is now dealing with transfiguration. So all of this was apparitions. The appearance of a peri spirit that looks like human from vaporous to dense, but it's not an incarnate, okay? So now, item 39. Since the spirit can perform transformations within the con contours of its perispiritual envelope, and since this envelope radiates all around the body like a fluidic atmosphere, a phenomenon similar to an apparition can be produced on the surface of the body itself. So what did he say? Let's pause. First of all, the perispirit he says, is an envelope and it radiates all around our bodies. So it's not just close to the physical body, it's radiating around the body like an, a fluidic atmosphere. So as we're moving through the world, we're, we're, our perispirit is surrounding us. We're creating this fluidic perispiritual atmosphere. I so wish I could see it, right? Maybe you guys would be interested in that too. But I haven't. I don't really have spirit side. I hear and smell, but I don't. I don't see. So, um, 
But yeah, so it's important for us to see that the perispiritual is an envelope and it's like a fluidic atmosphere. So then he says, since the spirit can perform transformations within the contours of its perispiritual envelope, so the spirit can, can create transformations like in apparitions, it can make itself visible, right? Even though a perispirit under normal circumstances is invisible to us incarnates. So consequently, apparitions can be produced that are really close to our physical bodies. So not just far away on a different continent or wherever, you know, the perispirit, as we just heard, learned, the perispirit can appear anywhere, doesn't need to be close to the body, right? But here in the form of transfigurations, the definition is, is that the apparition happens really close to the body. Now let's see what that means. So it, this apparition is produced on the surface of the body itself. So the perispirit changes to a point that it may appear as a completely different being like this one right next to my body, to our bodies. Under the fluidic layer, yeah, the perispiritual fluidic layer, the real image of the body can be erased more completely or less so and take on other traits. Wow. So under this changed perispiritual form, the physical body doesn't even appear like sunshine anymore, like sunshine's physical form anymore. So under the fluidic layer of the perispirit, the real image of the body can be erased more completely or less so and take on other traits or the original traits seen through the modified fluidic layer as through a prism can take on a different expression. So the perispirit fluidic layer is altered to a point that it actually changes the, the appearance of the physical body that's beneath that layer of perispirit. So transfiguration, right? If while setting aside the everyday world, the incarnate spirit identifies itself with things of the spirit world, so if we're focused on God, we're living a prayerful, service-oriented life, focusing on edifying study. The incarnate spirit identifies itself with things of the spirit world. The semblance of a homely face can become beautiful, radiant, and at times even luminous. So then this, our transfiguration because we align ourselves with spirits on high with God, with Jesus, with, with um, high level spirit mentors. In the case of a transfiguration, we may appear as luminous, radiant, beautiful. On the other hand, if the spirit is enticed by evil passions, an attractive face can take on a horrendous appearance. So this is transfigurations. This is what happened during transfigurations, which are always a reflection of the predominant qualities and sentiments of the spirit. Of course, right? Spirit is the driving force. It's the willpower. So depending on what the predominant qualities of the spirit are and the sentiments of the spirit, that determines how this transfiguration happens. Is it beautiful, aligned with spirits on high, or is it ugly and, and uh, finds affinity in spirits and lower level spirits due to passions? And we know that passions who are not educated, that are not bridal, that are not reined in, they can be very destructive. Is a type of it is a type of perispiritual apparition. So the transfiguration is a type of perispiritual apparition that may even be produced upon a living body. And sometimes at the moment of death instead of at a distance as in apparitions per se. So it can be happening around on top of a living body even. What distinguishes the apparitions of this kind is that they're usually perceptible to everybody's watching. 
and by the physical eyes. So these transfigurations can actually uh, more readily can be seen easier. And why is that? Because they are based on visible corporeal matter. Whereas in purely fluidic apparitions, there is no tangible matter. Because actually, as a result of this change perispiritual um, layer, so to speak, on top of this body, it actually changes the physique. Wow. So, I mean, we're not surprised that before Spiritism came along and, you know, in days gone by, that all of that would be labeled a miracle, right? All of a sudden, a body that's lying there uh, looks one way, one minute, and all of a sudden appears luminous and beautiful, right? Radiant. Or in the case of an affinity with lower level spirits, ugly and disfigured, right? So, so this is important. So in transfigurations, let's speak up. A spirit can perform transformations within the contours of its perispirit. So spirits have that capacity. The perispirit radiates all around the body. And consequently, these transfigur in the case of transfigurations, these apparitions can be produced on the surface of the body. So transfigurations are a form of apparitions, right? So under the fluidic layer of the perispirit, the real body image is erased partially or completely and takes on different traits. The face can become more beautiful or horrendous, depend looking depending on the spirit influence. So, um, so the transfigurations, let's see. What distinguishes the apparitions of this kind is that they are usually perceptible to everybody's watching and by the physical eyes precisely because they're based on visible corporeal matter. Whereas in purely fluidic apparitions, there is no tangible matter. So we said that already. So. The transfiguration result, transfigurations result are the result of a fluidic transformation. It's a type of perispiritual apparition. Transfiguration is produced upon a living body or, or at a moment of death. And a transfiguration is usually perceptible to everyone with their physical eyes because it's based on visible corporeal changed matter. So let us pause here in the um, in Genesis and let us go to for a moment to um, let's see to the medium spot because there we have another very interesting chapter about apparitions and Today, we focused on apparitions. So we're not going to read the whole chapter. It's long and it would be too much information. But if you like, you can go to the Medium's book on page 143, chapter 6. And it's entitled Visual Manifestations. And the subtitle is Questions Concerning Apparitions. And these questions are um, helpful. So of all spirit manifestations, Alec, Alan Kardec says, the most interesting are undoubtedly those in which spirits can render themselves visible. So can spirits render themselves visible? Yeah, we know already the answer. Yes, especially during sleep. So this is important for us to download. So our, um, spirits can particularly ren render themselves particularly visible during sleep. However, certain individuals can also see them while awake, although that is less frequent, right? So this is a little side note. Do spirits who visibly manifest themselves belong more to one specific category than to another? So are spirits 
who manifest themselves, who, so the, who are visible, do they belong to one category or another? And the answer is no. They can belong to all the categories of spirits, the highest down to the lowest. Interesting. So this is additional information. So it doesn't matter what the moral quality of a spirit is, an apparition can happen. For what purpose do spirits manifest themselves visibly? Good question. And the answer is it depends on their nature. Their purpose may be either good or evil. And it makes sense. If any spirit can create an apparition, of course the lower level spirits might have some malevolent um, intentions, right? What is the purpose of spirits who appear with good intentions? The answer is, to console those who are mourning their departure in order to prove to them that they continue to exist and are close by. They might also appear to give advice and sometimes to ask for assistance for themselves. So those who have good intentions might appear because they want to help those who are left behind and they might give advice or ask for assistance for themselves. Now, we've experienced that in heaven and hell so many times in the cases, the case studies we did before we started Genesis for the last year and a half, we had those situations where the spirits appeared, some of them needed help, others were giving very important educational messages to us. So those are some of the reasons why these apparitions might happen. Let's see what else. Um, what harm would there be if the possibility of seeing spirits were permanent and widespread among human beings? So what if we were surrounded by apparitions 24 seven? The answer is since human beings are constantly surrounded by spirits, it would be troublesome and would hamper them in their daily activities if they could see spirits all the time. Well, some mediums, they can't even drive a car. If you can see all the spirits everywhere and all the time, oh my heavens, how can you drive a car? Because maybe you can't really distinguish between an incarnate and a, and a spirit apparition, right? So that makes total sense. That could be, that could be challenging. It would also, in most cases, take away their initiative, while on the other hand, if, if they believe that they're alone, they will act more freely. Then the, the little the, um, footnote to this um, answer is, it would be very inconvenient if we were able to see spirits about us all the time. It would be like seeing the air that surrounds us or the myriad of microscopic animals that swarm around us. From this, we must conclude that what God has done is well done and that God knows better than we do what is best for us. Makes sense, right? So thank God we can see them all the time. So if being able to see spirits might be inconvenient, why is it permitted in certain cases then? So why, in certain cases, why can we see the apparitions and the answer is to provide proof that everything does not end with the death of the body and then of course we know to give advice and so that they can ask for help let us see what else we can what else we can can anyone um, who sees a spirit talk to it and we already know the answer because we just studied it certainly and that is exactly what should be done in such a case. Ask the spirit who it is, what it wants, and what can be done for it. So for those of us, this is important information. For those of us who have the capacity to see spirits, it is important that we talk to them. That is the invitation the spirits on high give us here in the medium's book. Ask them what they want and who they are and what be, can be done for them. Let's see what else can we do. Um, let's 
has so many questions. Very fascinating chapter. Um, does the seeing of spirits occur in the normal state or only during ecstasy? <coughs> so does the seeing of spirits occur in our normal state or only during ecstasy? And the answer is it can occur under perfectly normal conditions. However, those who see them are almost always in a special state which approaches ecstasy and which gives them a kind of second sight. This is important to know. But generally speaking, it can occur under perfectly normal conditions. So we don't have to be altered in an altered state to be able to see apparitions. Do those who see spirits do it with their eyes? And we already know the answer, right? They think they do, but in reality, it is their soul that sees. This is proven by the fact that they can still see them with their eyes closed. Right. How can the spirit render itself visible? Let's see. Maybe a different angle because we just learned how, how it does, right? So here the answer is the principle is the same as for all manifestations. It resides in the properties of the Perry spirit. So this is really one of the notes we want to take away from today. How important our peri spirit is, and also how important the quality of our peri spirit is. If we want to lend our peri spirit the quality of our fluids for healings, you know, it, it will help us to ward off evil spirits. We learned in the previous chapter that we have the remedy, the repellent built inside of us to ward off evil spirits. Why? Because if the quality of our fluids, if the quality of our perispirit is um, high, is pure, as pure as possible, then there's no affinity, right? So, so this, is, this is all vital. And how can we improve um, the quality of our perispirit? Well, we do it by following Emmanuel's um, uh, recommendation in Chapter 10 of Thought and Life is to undo the shackles we've forged against our own soul. We seek, we need to seek goodness, we need to visualize goodness. We need to feel goodness and mold it with all the resources we have at hand. So always seeing the good in everyone, practicing understanding as the foundation for our renewal. It is linking ourselves to God and the spirits on high through a prayerful life and um, being of service, always. Can a spirit per se make itself visible or can it only do so with the aid of the peri spirit? So can a spirit make itself visible per se or can it only do it with the help of the peri spirit? And the answer is, in your material state, spirits can only manifest themselves with the aid of their semi-material envelope, namely the peri spirit which is the intermediary through which they act upon your senses. Under this envelope, they can appear in human form or any other, whether in dreams or in the waking state, whether in full light or in darkness. Let's see. Could we say, oh no, let's see. Is everyone capable of seeing spirits? During sleep, yes, but not while awake, right? Because we don't all have the same capacity. Our spirit eyes are not all equally developed. What does the faculty for seeing spirits in the waking state depend on? So what does the faculty of us being able to see spirits with our spirit depend on? It depends on the organism and the greater or lesser ease with which the fluid of the seer combines with that of the spirit. So let's say that again. It depends on the organism and the greater or lesser ease with which the fluid of the seer combines with that of the spirit. Hence, it is not enough for the spirit simply to want to show itself. The spirit must find the required aptitude in the individuals to whom it wants to show itself. So it's not enough for a spirit to want to appear as in an apparition, but it also needs to meet 
an incarnate who has the capacity to see what they who has the capacity of spirit side to see what they saw. Dear friends, let us pause here. There is many more fascinating questions here. And then um, after those questions, item 101 um, is then the theoretical essay on apparitions. So it's warmly recommended to read it because it solidifies the information and it is vital for later on studying the actual so-called miracles in Genesis performed by Jesus. So we understand how we appeared to Mary Magdalene and all of that. It's the answers are all here. Um, all right, friends, let us let us um, conclude our study with immense gratitude in our hearts to God, to Jesus, to Alan Kardec for his diligent, intelligent, deep work that he gifted the world with for us to understand, to have the capacity to, for example, right now we're studying to understand what the mechanism behind miracles is, to scientifically explain it with the help of the natural laws is an immense gift. And we thank Cardiac Radio as well for having this opportunity to share this information, to study together. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining. It's so much more fun to have a few people on the other side, even though it's just a little green light we're looking at. Thank you for joining. And so God willing, we will be meeting again next week, same time. And we will be continuing our study. And next week, let's just look real quick what the exciting new chapter will be. It will be physical manifestations and mediumship. Wow, we can barely wait. So dear friends, thank you for joining. Much love. God bless you. Good night.